your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and get those open. We're going to be in the New Testament this morning. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, and then we'll be in the Gospel of John a little bit afterwards. Uh, But before I get started, I want to ask why I should first say Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I loved the reading that Samantha read this morning. I think it was beautiful. I think it was well done. Whoever whoop whooped, shout out to you too. Come on now. Give those moms a whoop whoop. Well, hey, uh, before we get started, though, uh, and look at those passages, I want to ask, do we have any runners in the room? Maybe just like a small little hand raise or a little head nod. We got a couple. I know some students. We got some runners. Yeah, Jackson, I saw we ran that 5K together. The themes, you guys were there. I think you guys beat me. That's all right. Reagan, Wilson, if you're in the room, I know for sure that you beat me in the 5K. Um, All shamelessly or shamefully admit it, I don't know. But um, a couple of years ago, I got into running. I guess I shouldn't say a couple. It's, man, time flies when you get old, and I'm not even that old. So um, back in college, probably early college, I kind of got into running. I picked it up, uh, and over the last couple of years, I've gotten a little bit more into it as each uh, year progresses. I, I find myself running more and more, uh, but I'm not much of a racer. Um, so I know that I kind of ratted on myself. I do the, the turkey trot 5K on Thanksgiving in Huntington. But other than that, uh, I just can't find it within myself to pay money to go and to do something that I can do for free. So, I mean, I can walk out my front door and it's like, all right, if I want to run a 5K, I'll tell my watch, hey, let me know when I've ran three miles. Um, but uh, So I've done the turkey trot a couple times. I've done one down in Indy. But other than that, Uh, Like I said, I just can't justify uh, wanting to pay to go run. But a couple of years ago, uh, I think probably two or three years ago, uh, I decided that I wanted to run a half marathon. Uh, Yeah, you laugh, you wait, (laughs) you wait. Um, But I had been running for a while now, and so on some of my longer runs, like I could get maybe five, six, if I was feeling really good, I could get seven miles. And so I wanted to take that next step. I was like, all right, 13 miles, what's that? Like, let's do this. Uh, But I've never really ran that far, and I had done the 5K. I've done, like I said, the five, six, seven miles, and so just naturally I wanted to keep pushing myself. Uh, But I didn't know where to start. I knew just from my limited experience in middle school and high school running on the track team, uh, mainly because I was probably required to play three sports by my family, Um, I had zero idea where to begin for a run of that length. I knew you needed to train yourself. Like, you just can't go out and run 13 miles and be like, hey, that was awesome, good deal. So I did what any person uh, in their mid-20s would do uh, when they don't know how to do something. Uh, I got my phone out, I went to the app store, and I downloaded an app. And I downloaded the Under Armour Map My Run uh, run tracker, pedometer, whatever you'd call that. Uh, and I paid for like a, a six month subscription and I got access to like a half marathon training plan for beginners. Uh, and like I said, if you've ever ran a half marathon or if you've just ever ran in general uh, and you want to do a longer race, you know that on the first day of training, you don't just go out and you run that complete distance, right? Uh, if I wanted to run a half marathon on day one, uh, I would probably cry if my training plan said, all right, go out and run 13 miles. <laughs> like, that's, that's not how it works. What you do is you go out and maybe on the first week you run one maybe two miles each time. Uh, And then the next week you build up, maybe you're running two, maybe three miles. And then the week after that, four, four and a half, and then maybe you take a break. Uh, But you keep stacking and you keep building. And over the course of time, you begin to become the kind of person who can then run 13.1 miles. And so that's what I was doing, that's what I was going for. Uh, And like I said, when it comes to long runs, it's all about training right? You don't just go out and run 13.1 miles. It's all about training, not trying. If you were to try your way to complete a half marathon, uh, if you finish it, you'll probably be in some pretty serious pain. Your legs will probably be pretty sore, uh, and you probably won't be feeling pretty well. But if you go through a training plan and prepare yourself, you train yourself to run that type of distance, then odds are you're going to be able to complete that race, and you're going to be able to do it in a time that you want And so as I went through this training regimen for a half marathon, uh, the day came to run the half marathon, race day. But again, like I said, I'm not much of a racer, so I needed my own trail, my own path to run the full 13 miles. Uh, And as much training as I put into the half marathon, uh, let's just say I wasn't completely prepared. (laughs) 
Uh, something came up that I wasn't quite trained for, I wasn't quite ready for, uh, but I'm going to finish that story later. I'll tell you that at the end. Uh, but for now, like Samantha said, uh, this week and for the next three weeks, the remaining three Sundays in May, we are starting a new series called Out of Focus. And to start this series, I want to read a quote from Dallas Willard. And if you don't know who Dallas Willard is, all I can say is this. Uh, right now, you have my permission. Pull out your smartphone, get on Amazon, search Dallas Willard, uh, look through all the books that he's written and find a title uh, that seems interesting to you, buy it, read it, and don't just read it once. Probably read it multiple times. Give it to your friends. Mark it up. Dallas Willard is an incredible author. Uh, in one of his most popular books, The Great Omission, uh, subtitled Reclaiming Jesus' Essential Teachings on Discipleship, he says this. I think we'll have it up on the screen for you guys. He says, the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs, so think about that, the greatest issue facing our world today is whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians will become disciples or students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. Again, what Dallas Willard says, of the greatest issues facing our world, the biggest issue that he sees is whether those who call themselves Christians will actually become disciples of Jesus. And the reason I want to start here is because over the course of the next three weeks, as we go throughout this Out of Focus series, we are going to be looking at what most scholars claim are the three essential goals to discipleship. And so in the time of Jesus, if you were going to be a follower, if you were going to be a disciple, there were three goals that you would orient your whole life around. And over the next three weeks, we are going to look at those three goals, and we're going to talk about why those were important then, but also why those are just as important and just as crucial for us today as we consider our own discipleship to Jesus. But before I tell you the first goal, I want to set one ground rule. So if you're taking notes, uh, maybe write this down. One ground rule, not just for this Sunday, uh, for the first goal, but maybe for the entire series, is that when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to um, these three goals, the one ground rule that I think we all must have is that we must think subtraction, not addition. We must think subtraction and not addition. Following Jesus, I don't think, is about doing more. It's not about doing more things, going to more church events, adding uh, more to your plate. All of us are already too busy and too tired. Moms, can I get an amen? Come on now, there we go. Um, and so following Jesus, it's not about doing more. Rather, what I would argue for us in the Western 21st century church, following Jesus is not about doing more. It is about doing less. It is about subtraction, not addition. And so the reason that we're calling this series out of focus is because if I had to guess, most of us in this room, if not all of us, live our lives at such a hurried pace that we can only see what's directly ahead of us. In fact, most of the things going on in our peripherals, we have no really idea unless someone not nudges us and says, hey, look at that. All of us, like this picture, everything is just going by way too fast. And when it comes to following Jesus, the same temptation exists. Discipleship following our Messiah becomes a checklist, and we can fall into the trap that it's our participation or what we do that saves us. And so to start, if you're in Mark, uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. I'd like to first look at the call of Jesus, the invitation that Jesus has for his first disciples and for his disciples today. And so starting in Mark chapter 1, verse 16, this is what we read. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, that is Jesus, he saw James, son of Zebedee, 
and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they too left their nets, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The invitation of Jesus has always been and always will be to come and to follow him. And today that might sound a little weird if some random guy just came up to you while you were at your job or at school or wherever you may be most of your time and just said, hey, drop what you're doing and come hang out with me. Come spend time with me. Just come follow me. But this idea was very common in the time of Jesus because in the first century Palestine region, Jesus was, is known as a rabbi. More commonly, more than any other name Jesus is given in the New Testament is rabbi, which is teacher. Jesus is a teacher. And to be a teacher in the first century was to call disciples to come and to learn from you, to apprentice under you, to be a student under you, ultimately to be your disciples. And like I said at the beginning, there were three things that every disciple would orient their lives around to be a follower of a rabbi. And the Greek word that we translate for disciple in the New Testament, it's called mathetes. And if you were a mathetes in the New Testament, you had three primary goals that you oriented your life around. And that first goal that we're going to be talking about this morning is to be with your rabbi. So the big idea this morning uh, is to be a disciple of Jesus, is to be with Jesus. All throughout this building, uh, we have our mission and our vision up on signs. Uh, and on there, it says that we at Markle Church of Christ, we want to develop lifelong followers of Jesus. Also known as, we want everyone who comes through our doors to be a disciple of Jesus. And if you are going to be a disciple of Jesus, the first, and what I would argue, the most primary and central thing you can do to be a disciple is to be with Jesus. And this may seem obvious, but again, I think that we live our lives at such a hurried pace that we often are going too fast to slow down and to remember this very simple truth. Our primary objective of being a disciple to Jesus is to be with Jesus. And if we are going to take serious Jesus' invitation to come and to follow him, we have to understand this core truth. My brother-in-law, he's an electrician. If I wanted to be an electrician, I would need to go and I would maybe apprentice myself to my brother-in-law. I would go, I would spend time with him. I would do the things that he does with the hope that one day he will send me out to be an electrician myself. But that first and most important thing, if I wanna be an electrician, is I need to go be with him. I need to follow him around. And the one difference, though, between a modern uh, illustration like that and a, a translation like a disciple to Jesus is that after I'm done apprenticing or being a disciple of my brother-in-law, I'm going to go home. I'm going to call it a day at five, six, whenever he gets done with work. But in the time of Jesus, to be with Jesus was something that you did every day for the full day, all week, all the time. You walked with them. You ate with them. You sat with them. You uh, stayed in the same house as them. You were with your rabbi 24-7. There's this Hebrew blessing from the time of Jesus that I just absolutely love. It goes like this. It says, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Point being that if you were going to be a disciple, you needed to be so close to your rabbi, to your teacher, that when they walked, the dust that they would kick up with their feet would then cover you, and that would be a blessing. And so again, to follow Jesus is to be with Jesus. And for those of you who want to know how that looks like today in 2023, what's the practical uh, application look like for this? Uh, flip over your Bibles a couple pages to the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 14 and 15. And we drop in mid-scene with Jesus preparing his disciples for his coming departure. So John, the author, he slows down in this final pericope of Scripture, and he's giving the disciples, uh, or he's recording Jesus giving the disciples his final message, preparing them for the cross. And Jesus promises them that even though he is leaving, he is not leaving his disciples alone. Jesus says this in chapter 14, starting in verse 15. He says, If you love me, 
keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate or helper to help you and to be with you forever. Not just for the week, not just for the month, not just for the year, but forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. For the disciples, if they were going to continue to follow Jesus even after he left, it was going to be through the help and by the power of the advocate. And after Jesus' ascension to the right hand of the Father, the first goal, the primary focus of discipleship did not change. It was still to be with Jesus, to be with the Holy Spirit. Even today, I would argue, to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to be aware of and connected to the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. To be a disciple of Jesus, to be with Jesus today, what that looks like, what the practical application of that looks like, is to be aware of and connected to the Holy Spirit. And to do that, I think we have to begin training ourselves to be able to be in two places at once. To be at work in your office, getting ready to turn a report in or whatever, and to be aware of the Holy Spirit's presence amongst you and your coworkers. Or to be in your classroom for those teachers or those students, and to be connected to the power of the Holy Spirit in your classroom to be in your car on your way to that next thing, to be aware of and to be connected to the Holy Spirit. As disciples of Jesus, we have to begin practicing being with Jesus no matter where you are. And I love how Jesus explains this in his analogy in the next chapter over, chapter 15, when Jesus says this. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Therefore, I love this, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. To be with Jesus is to be like a vine connected, or to be like a branch connected to a vine. It's about being aware of and connected to the Holy Spirit's presence no matter where you are. And if we're going to follow Jesus and become his disciples, we have to begin to orient our lives in a way where Jesus is the center. We have to begin to live in a way and orient ourselves that enables us to abide in the presence of the Holy Spirit no matter where we are. If you've ever read the message translation, uh, I love how Eugene Peterson translates this passage in John chapter 15. He says, live in me. Make your home in me, just as I do in you. Several of you in the room this morning, you know what it's like to see a a plot of ground and to build a home there. And Jesus is giving you that same invitation with him to come and to make your home in him. And no matter where you are in your relationship with Jesus, the baseline for discipleship, the starting point is being with Jesus. It's a connection to and it's an awareness of the Holy Spirit. It's about remaining. It's about abiding. It's about building a home in Jesus, like a vine to a branch. It's receiving the call to come and to follow him. And so as I wrap up this morning, I started with my story about a half marathon. And some of you, I won't call out any names, you laughed at me. And that's okay. And so like I said, I had trained I think it was a 10-week plan that I, I trained for this half marathon, and it was the day to run. I think it was a Saturday, and I had trained, like I said, for a couple of months now. 
I was ready. Uh, what seemed super difficult at the beginning uh, was now seemed like something that I could achieve. You know, early on, it's like 13 miles. That's a lot. I don't know if I can do that. But as I slowly built up and was running 6, 8, 10, 12 miles, I felt like, yeah, this, this, this is easy. I can make this work. There were several of those longer runs that I came back and I felt good. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, it's not in me to pay to go run. So I needed, like I said, to find my own route. Uh, and it turns out that if you leave my driveway in Huntington, I live in town uh, just next to General Slack Park. Maybe you shouldn't have said that. I don't want any students coming and visiting me. I don't need... I did get forked one time, so I know some of you know where I live. Who puts forks in people's yards? What a waste of forks. Anyway, if you leave from my driveway and you head towards Hires Park, you know where the county fair is, uh, and you turn, uh, if you're going towards the south side of town, if you turn left on Taylor Street uh, and head towards Markle, that Taylor Street eventually turns into 300. For all of those who are like, you love cardinal directions and everything, you're like, you're like drooling at the mouth. You're like, oh yeah, south, east, west. For those of you who are like, Hires Park, I don't even know what that means. Hey, that's all right. I'm with you there. Uh, but if you come all the way on 300, you'll come right after you uh, cross over the interstate to 600, and you turn on 600 and head towards Markle, uh, and you weave your way through town. You end up back here at the church parking lot. That's like 13.2 miles. I did that one day on my drive into work, and I was like, this is perfect. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to run my half marathon. And so one Saturday morning, uh, the plan was to wake up pretty early. Uh, it was late August, so pretty warm, pretty humid. Uh, I decided I'm going to wake up extra early. I'm going to drive my car here to the church. I'm going to drop it off. I'll hide my keys in the building somewhere. I'll find those later. Uh, and I'm just going to run home, and I'm just going to go for it. And so that was the plan. I got here at like 4.30 in the morning, did a little warm-up, got stretched out, got ready to run. Uh, took off, headed through town, headed out on 600, got over the interstate, got to about mile six or seven. And you're like, all right, you're feeling pretty good. You got to get a good little sweat going. The, the sun was starting to come up over the corn. Uh, and so the temperature rose uh, pretty heavy uh, within like 30 minutes, it felt like. And so um, hopefully none of you drove, like if any of you saw this, like, oh my gosh, this is the most embarrassing story in the world. Um, but I got a little warm, uh, pressed on, kept going. Uh, got to about mile nine or ten, uh, and I started to feel this weird pain, like from my armpits down to my hips and into my lower back. And I just like, I don't know, I'd never felt it really before. I didn't really know uh, what was happening. Uh, but I decided, you know, I'll just keep, keep going. I want to get back at least to Hires Park. Um, but I had to stop and walk a couple times, which let me say, runners walk. If you have to stop and walk, that's okay. Uh, it's very normal. <laughs> Maybe saying that more for myself than for you. Um, either way, I heard it. So, um, but I made my way back to Hires Park in this pain. It just kept growing in my sides, uh, more towards my lower back now and in my back. Um, and I just had to sit down. I was beat. I was whooped. It was like 95 degrees, you know, 100% humidity. Uh, those uh, Augusts in Indiana, those aren't pleasant to run 13 miles in. Um, and so I got there. I sat down. Uh, I, I was trying to remember as I was preparing for this if they had a water fountain, but if I did tell you that I drank from a water fountain at a public park, I don't know if that says anything good about myself. Um, but anyway, it, after my pit stop, Hires Park, it's like less than two miles from my house. So I was like, all right, here's the deal. I'll, uh, I'll bite my lip, I'll like hit myself in the knee, something. Let me focus my pain somewhere else. If I have to stop and walk to get home, I'll do that. I just want to make it home. I'm less than two miles away from home. Let's just finish this race. Let's say you did it, uh, and, and let's move on. And so I headed out from Hires Park, and I made it down to Yalman Park, which if you're familiar with kind of the south side of Huntington, it's like a half mile away. So I made it to Yalman Park, and I just had to throw in the towel. I remember like just being like whooped. I was beat. I had to, to call my wife, probably wake her up. I said, Hannah, I can't do it. Will you come pick me up? And listen, my house from Yalman Park is like not even a half mile. So, you know, you're like, she's, she's driving me back home the like 30 seconds to get home it is. And I like look at my, uh, my mile tracker and it's like, I made it 12.5, 12.6 miles. And I think about that moment, I'm like, oh my gosh, Nick, were you in that much pain that you just couldn't like even walk? But I remember, you could probably ask Hannah, like I was just sitting on a curb in town, just like sprawled out. Like, I thought I was going to die. It was terrible. Uh, like I said, my back, my sides were hurting. Uh, and when I got home, 
After I showered, I looked up uh, just like a quick Google search, you know, why, why was this happening to me? Uh, and it turns out that usually on those longer runs, especially in the summer, you, you want to take some sort of hydration with you. Um, so it turns out I was severely dehydrated. Uh, I hadn't had any water, you know. It was the middle of summer, all the humidity. Like, I was sweating through everything I owned. It felt like I was running through puddles. My feet were so gross and blistered afterwards. Um, and so I, uh, I think that was like my kidneys almost like shutting down is what was happening to my body. Uh, so I learned a lot about myself that day. Uh, I learned a lot about running that day. And so I drank some water and I took a pretty righteous nap afterwards. Uh, and I haven't worked my way back up into that yet. I, uh, maybe one day I, I would like to complete a half marathon, if not maybe a marathon. Uh, please don't hold me to that because I say a lot of things. Um, but <laughs> the reason that I tell you this story, uh, what does this have to do with being out of focus, being with Jesus? The reason that I tell you this story is because when it comes to following Jesus, following Jesus, it's not about trying. Following Jesus is about training. Like I said in the beginning, if you wanted to just go out and run a half marathon, you've never really ran, you're probably a little out of shape, then you're going to get hurt. You're not going to do well. You're not going to know that you need to take water. Your kidneys are going to ache and burn, and you're going to have to call your significant other to come pick you up. But if you train, not just physically, but mentally too a little bit, you inform yourself, then you will be able to complete a half marathon. And the same is true for following Jesus. If you want to be the kind of person who Jesus has created you to be, from the oldest to the youngest in the room, you need to begin training yourself in discipleship to Jesus. So as we close this morning, I want to, the last passage I want to look at is from Paul in Galatians, uh, chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. It's the fruit of the Spirit. We're all familiar with it. It says, the fruit of, or Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if you'll remember Jesus' analogy in John chapter 15, Paul picks up that same analogy and he says, if you are to remain, if you are to abide, if you are going to produce fruit, these are some of the fruits that you will produce. And you don't produce fruit. Think of an apple tree. An apple tree doesn't produce apples by trying really hard. <laughs> It's slowly over time that it produces the fruit, and the same is true for us. If you're going to produce kindness, peace, patience, self-control, it's a day in, day out being with Jesus. If it was about willpower, all of us would probably have to throw in the towel by 10 o'clock. If it was about trying really hard, we would eventually run out, but it is about training and becoming a disciple of Jesus. If we want to be the kind of disciple whose entire life is defined by the fruits of the Spirit, it starts with an awareness of and a connection to the Holy Spirit. It's by being with Jesus. And so as we enter into this time of communion, the challenge for you all this week is to spend time with Jesus. And my challenge, more specifically, it's not anything crazy, it's not anything groundbreaking, uh, it's not going to cost you anything, but the average American spends about two hours a day on their phone. Two hours of screen time, that's average. I asked a couple students down in the underground this morning how, uh, how high their screen time was. Six, seven, eight hours on their phones. Mine, I just got my report in for the morning. Uh, last week, it was about two and a half hours. The average person, let's just say, you spend two hours a, a day on your phone. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to spend one hour and 50 minutes on your phone. I want you to take that 10 minutes you get back from scrolling, commenting, posting, sharing, whatever it may be, and I would just challenge you to sit in silence, to sit in solitude, to be alone. You don't have to pray, you don't have to do anything, but to just sit and to be and to remind yourself of the ever-present nature of our God whether it's in the morning before your day starts or whether it's in the evening once the kids have gone down for bed uh, and it's quiet and it's dark out, whenever it may be, 
find five, ten minutes where you can take off your smartwatches, you can turn off your phone, you can turn off the TV, where you can just quietly sit and rest in the Father's presence. And if you're anything like me, when you try this, it's going to feel weird, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be a struggle. You're going to reach for your phone and you're going to grab it and you're going to be like, man, that 30 minutes, that flew by. And you're going to look and you're going to see that only three minutes went by and you're going to be like, wow, I got some work to do. (laughs) And that's okay. Start where you're at, not where you should be. If three minutes is all you can handle, start with three minutes. Give yourself extra grace, but spend some time alone resting in the Father's presence. Use it as an opportunity to slow down and acknowledge God's presence that has been with you, that has never left you, and that will continue to be with you. It's an opportunity for us to say, for us to stop and to breathe and to say, God, I'm here, I'm back, and you're here. You never left, Uh, but I wasn't here earlier uh, when I was angry and I lost my patience with my kids. Or I wasn't here earlier when I was at work or when I was at school, uh, but I'm back now and I acknowledge that you are still here, you are still with me, uh, and that's enough for me. And so practice this week, carve out five, ten minutes each day where you can just spend time being with Jesus. Practicing the presence of God, it's not something that you figure out in a day. It's not something that you're going to figure out in a week, in a month, in a year. It's not something that one year from now you can come back to me and say, Nick, I have mastered practicing being with Jesus. It's something that will take you an entire lifetime. But I promise you, if you begin to train yourself, if you begin to orient yourself in a way that keeps Jesus at the center— Jesus as your focus, you will begin to see the transformational work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and those fruits will slowly become more and more evident, and you will be pervaded by things like kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, patience, or forbearance, and self-control. And so as we enter into this time of communion, for the next couple of moments, I just want to give you a time to stop and reflect right here and to right now. And I want you to put yourself in a position, maybe you need to set your phone under your seat, Uh, maybe you need to take your smartwatch off, whatever that looks like, uh, to just stop, to focus on your breathing, and to acknowledge God, even if it's just God, you're here. And that's enough. It doesn't have to be this crazy elaborate prayer, but reflect in these next couple of moments on the ever-present God that we worship, that we serve through the Holy Spirit. And then afterwards, I'll come back and we'll lead us in communion. I think when it comes to being with Jesus, taking the Lord's Supper is one of maybe the most tangible things that we can do. And Jesus said that on the night that he was betrayed, uh, he took a bread and he took a cup and he said that these emblems would be reminders of my presence, of what I've done amongst you. But like he said also in John, that he's not leaving us alone. And so each and every Sunday, we as believers in the resurrected Lord, we come together and we recognize this and we celebrate it. And we take the bread and we eat it because this is the body of Christ which was broken for us.
And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. And so we likewise, we take and we drink of the cup. Let's pray. God, you are here. And I just want to acknowledge that. You are present. You are among us. You are right here, right now. And Father, while we can't comprehend that, we rest in that truth. And Father, I pray that as we go into our weeks this week, I pray that we would just find those those spaces each and every day to be with you, to spend time with you, to recognize your presence among us, to be aware of and connected to your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that we would be challenged to make our primary goal about being with you, Father. Thankful for these people, thankful for the mothers, thankful for the children who are in the room this morning. And I pray that as we go throughout our weeks that you would just continue to remind us of your presence no matter where we are. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.